quietly abiding, Jesus is mine. Constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers oh so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. And I hope and pray that you can sing that one from the heart. And I pray that Jesus is yours. Now on Wednesday night, a lot of times, most of the time, what we do is a question and answer time. And uh, I say most of the time because it's not always what we do. And uh, we have had guest speakers on Wednesdays. And, and if the Lord leads to do it differently, we'll have just a message that I believe the Lord has led. Um, I have three questions with answers right now that um, I can deal with. But I'm going to ask... Right off the top, before we go into any further, um, does anybody have any questions in relation to what they would like as far as an answer from the Word of God? Can I tell you this? That's where you need to get your answers from, okay? So anybody have a question about anything that they would like an answer from the Word of God on? Any questions at all? Yes, sir? What does the Bible say about dragons? About dragons? They exist. Oh, you don't want to just stop there? Well, well, I, I will say this. Um, we'll go into Revelation and we'll see a verse, okay? We'll, we'll, I'll show you a verse um, in Revelation chapter 12. We'll go, to, we'll go there first, okay? Revelation chapter 12. All right, Revelation chapter 12, about dragons. We are in a generation that what we take is we take history. And we, what we're in, doing now is we're trying to rewrite everything of the past. We want to criticize every one of the founding fathers. We want to make them all heathens. We want to make them all drunks. We want to make them all just ungodly men and some of them were some of them were but not all of them and the further we get away from those days we can write whatever we want and who can question us because those men can't answer for themselves and so we're rewriting and we're twisting things and and so in revelation chapter 12 i want you to look at one verse here Verse number 7, Revelation 12, 7. This is, a, this is one of those the knights on their steed with the dragon fighting. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 says, And there was, a, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. We think about that. You don't understand it. Why not? Because we don't have scriptural context clarity. We just took a verse, huh? And it sounds so neat. You got angels and dragons fighting. Yeah, that makes for great storytelling. Yeah, but let's find out what the scriptures are talking about. So let's continue. We're not going to stop there. That's why we want to get scriptural clarity. So it says in verse 8, And prevailed not, the dragon and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I believe the description of the devil himself, of Satan himself, the description of the dragon, the description of the serpent, 
I believe this very description itself represents dragons throughout all of history. I believe they're all serpent-like, okay? I believe that. Now, he was called a dragon. He was called a serpent. Now, if you look in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, dragons, according to depictions and historical pictures, now I've never seen one, but according to drawings and paintings and pictures, what do they have? They have serpent-like bodies, every one of them. They have legs, don't they? And some of them walk around on land in fictional books. Read the fictional books about the knights and they fight dragons that walk around and fly around, don't they? Those are fictional ones. But in paintings of people who say they sighted them and have seen them, where do they see them at? Where do they act the actual sightings occur? Mm -mm. Water. They sight them around water. The drawings of these dragons that are overturning boats and everything else, they're water creatures. They're around water, but they breathe air. Look at this. Verse, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So this serpent is communicating with Eve. Now, who is this serpent? We know, according to the scriptures, who is the deceiver? Satan. Satan. So we know that this very serpent himself was Satan, right? So, now, listen to the words here. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So, this serpent, I want you to look now, and we're going to jump down to, chap to verse 14. Same chapter, verse 14. Because of this serpent convincing Eve to sin, this serpent, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, verse 14, Because thou hast done this, Thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. You don't get to walk around anymore. Now, why would he tell this thing it couldn't walk around anymore and had to go on its belly if it couldn't walk in the first place, if it already couldn't walk? So, obviously, it had the ability to walk at one time. And God cursed this kind of creature because that was the one that Satan used to deceive Eve. Now, Satan throughout history has always been called, throughout the Bible, the serpent, the dragon. Now, let's go to the book of Job. The book of Job. This is a, this is a description of a creature that was alive in the days of Job. Job gave some descriptions of a couple of creatures in this book, and people want to tell us Wonderful stories, and they want to make up what this creature is. I can't remember if this one was an alligator, someone said, and the other, there's another one he describes, they call it, they say it might be a hippo, or they have all kinds of things that they want to tell us. If you listen to the description of this creature, you're like, uh-uh, it can't be an alligator, it can't be a hippo, it can't be whatever they want it to be. This is a unique creature made by God. And Job chapter 41 Job chapter 41. Now, what do you use to go catch things in the water? You use two different major devices. What are the, what are the two main devices that you use to catch something in the water? I've never caught anything on a rod yet. A hook. The rod doesn't catch them. <laughs> The hook does. And a net. 
I, you see, you got to be very careful with your words. I'm going to be very detailed. So a net or a hook. I want you to look at this. In verse 1, Job 41, verse 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook? Or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? They're lowering a, a cord, a rope with a hook and trying to catch this thing. Listen. Canst thou put an hook into its nose or bore its jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Um, what creature actually spoke soft words? The serpent, the dragon in the Garden of Eden, the subtle one. I believe it's the very description of the very creature that he impersonated. Listen carefully. He says this. Verse, three, will he uh, verse 4. Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? You're going you're gonna to put a, a, a leash on one of these and give it to your, your daughters, the little girls. Here you go. Here's a new pet for you. Listen as he tells you what this creature looks like. Um, it says, uh, verse 12. It says, I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. Who's going who's gonna to open the mouth of that thing? You don't want to open it. Listen carefully. His scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. The scales of this thing overlap so closely it's like a sealed body. You can't, it's impenetrable. One is so near to the other that no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. You can't, you can't get between the scales of this creature to take its life. By his kneesings, what is a kneesing? It's an old-fashioned word for sneezing. It's an old-fashioned word for sneezing. By the sne his sneezings, the breathing out of his nose... A light doth shine. What is that? It's called fire breathing out of his nostrils. This creature can breathe fire. And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps. What can he do? He can breathe fire. And sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned into joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yea, his heart is a piece of a nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. By reason of breakings, they purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. You hit him with a sword, it doesn't stick into him. The spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. You can't spear him. You can't kill this creature. You can't kill him. He esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him and turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. And we can go on about this creature. What do I believe? I believe dragons existed. I believe Satan himself revealed himself as this very creature in all of its beauty and might and power and strength and everything else, but yet with soft words. And able to what? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? I believe Satan himself came as one of these a leviathan, a, a, a fire-breathing, serpent-like dragon. At one time that could walk, but now is limited. And you, that the creature doesn't just show up in Job. It shows up at other times. There's a couple, one or two other places in the Bible it shows up. So I believe they existed. Yeah. Isaiah 27. I did not have it memorized. Yes, Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. Isaiah 27, 1.
In that day the Lord with his, store, his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, even Leviathan that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And uh, of course the devil comes from the pits of hell, the lake of fire. He is a serpent. He revealed himself as one and took that form to convince Eve that God was not really who he said he was, that he was just trying to keep us suppressed so that we didn't, we didn't know good and evil. God was trying to hide it from us. And, uh, you know, that's the biggest thing the world does. They try to convince you that God's keeping things from you and that you're really missing out on some things in life. But I do believe, according to the scriptures, that there are or at one time were dragons, that there is at least one dragon still alive. At this point, Satan, the great dragon, because the, in Revelation that has not been fulfilled yet. So that will be fulfilled. So he is still in existence. And do I know what is in the seas and the oceans of our world to this day? We still have no clue what's down there. And we have all kinds of theories up and down. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speculate one way or another. I'm gonna say, there's some of them that are so deep, things could exist. And uh, there's, there's parts of Africa still that claim that they have creatures out in their jungles that nobody's ever seen. And there's some amazing descriptions. But do I believe dragons represent Satan? No. Do I believe Satan himself took on the form of a dragon and represent, and now... Because of that, they have all this evilness about them because of Satan? Absolutely. I believe he destroyed the beauty and the abilities of one of God's creations and creatures that God himself had made. And God cursed all the others because of Satan himself. And, uh, but I do believe they existed. Only because the Bible says. That's the only reason. Because I haven't seen one. So I have to believe it according to the Bible. Yes, sir? Why did he curse that certain animal and not every other animal? Well, he... he According to that, ver fra that passage in Genesis, he cursed it so that it could never walk again. But that was the only curse that he put on it. Other than that, all animals were cursed because of the sin of man. The whole earth was cursed because of the sin of man. So technically everything, all the plants, all the animals, everything has a curse on it. And... That's why in, in Revelation, the verses that we've seen over and over, that one day God is going to destroy this whole earth and everything in it. It's because of the sin of man. And everything that we handle and touch is cursed. We, we have destroyed his creation. But he's merciful. He gives us a chance to repent so that we can enjoy the beauty of the new heaven and the new earth with him. But because of that very act of Satan himself, God cursed that creature. And, uh, and now obviously the verse, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. There was something, spe something special and specific about that creature that that's why Satan chose. I want to be that one. I don't want to portray myself as that one. Of course, it had to be something that Eve would not be startled by. It had to be something that they were used to. Um, you know, you see something big and amazing like that, and then it talks to you. That'd just be amazing, wouldn't it? To see a dragon talk to you? I think we'd all stop and just listen. I don't know if you'd even try to run from something like that. You just, I mean, when you got something that can just breathe fire out of its nose, you just, you just don't run from it. You just stop and wonder, are we friends? So, all right. I had a question asked. Did Jesus carry his cross? Did he push it to the... Hill, did he pull it? How did Jesus get his cross to where they crucified him? How did he get it there? Boom. 
but where do we find it? Exactly. That's why we got to find out what the Bible says, huh? Let's go to Matthew. I've got, I've, I've got a few verses I want to show you. If, you. if we understand the context of Scripture, I want to show you something that I think was very interesting to study out. Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to go to all four Gospels, okay? I'm going to take a moment. I'm going to go to every one of these. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to find a verse in all of them. And then I'm going to take you to one more. I've got five verses written down on this that I think will be very interesting. Um, we're going to start in Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. Now, if we, if we understand, and I do believe that there's a way that these men all wrote these books that portrays Jesus in a different sense. So if you think along those lines, if you think along those lines, then you will understand, I believe, some things. I believe Matthew wrote about Jesus as the king, okay? If you study the whole book of Matthew, it portrays Jesus in a kingly fashion. I believe Mark wrote about Jesus as a servant. If you study the book of Mark, there's things that Mark didn't write about and did write about. And all these men wrote about different things in different ways. And Mark shows Jesus as a servant, always a servant of man, always serving other people, serving people. Luke, if you study, Luke wrote about Jesus, I believe, as a Jesus, as the man that he was. Just as a man. And then John, I believe, writes about Jesus as God. Now, they all will refer to Jesus in the different aspects. But I believe that the, a key theme that you could look at when you look at those books, have those thoughts behind them. Jesus as king, Jesus as servant, Jesus as man, and then Jesus as God. And if you keep those in mind, you'll see some things in those books. I believe that'll give you some understandings that are just inspiring as far as studying those books. So Matthew chapter 27, look at verse 31. Matthew 27, 31, listen up. If you have a question, you're going to want an answer from the Bible, right? So listen carefully. Matthew 27, 31. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the rope off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. They, leave, they walk him, it says... They led him away, they came out, and then they got Simon to what? Bear his cross. Matthew sees this event. Jesus comes out, and they get a man named Simon to carry his cross. Let's go to Mark. Keep that in mind. Mark chapter 15. Mark's testimony, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse number 20. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. So this man's coming into town. He comes from a country, the country. He's coming in. They're coming out. They see him. Hey, carry this cross. Simon. Mark talks about it. Let's go to Luke. Luke 23. Luke 23. Luke chapter 23, we're going to read verse 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. 
But who carried the cross? All three of these testimonies said Simon carried the cross, don't they? They said they came out, they brought Jesus out. They walked him out and there's a man coming out of the country and they get him and they say, you carry the cross. Now, let's go to the book of John. Let's go to the book of John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Let me ask you, if, if you know anything about this story, where was John during the trial? During the trial of Jesus, where was John? John was on the inside. You see, John had friends higher up. John was on the inside, and he got somebody else in with him. You remember who he had with him? Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times, remember? And then what did Peter do? What did Peter do after he denied Jesus three times? He leaves. Peter gets out of there. Where's John? Picture the trial. John's on the inside. John's, the city is getting ready for the, the Passover week. The city is, people are getting ready for the Passover. They're getting ready for the major events. Jesus is on trial. Peter's on the, in, or John's on the inside. Everybody else is getting ready. The trial happens. I want you to picture this. John chapter 19, verse number 16. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away, and he bearing his cross went forth unto a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. Who carried the cross there? Who carried the cross? He bearing his cross, and they crucified him. Who is that referring to? And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. It had to be Jesus. Jesus carried his cross out of that place of trial. And when they got out of there, and possibly when they came out, we don't know how far out. I don't know if they met Simon outside the city or outside the courthouse, the trial house. But I know that at some point when they got out of there, then they brought Simon in to help get that cross the rest of the way. But John on the inside, all he saw was what? He saw Jesus leaving, carrying his own cross. Everybody else was on the outside. So all the other disciples and all the other followers of Christ, what do they see? They see Simon carrying the cross. John on the inside, he saw his Savior carrying that cross. I believe there's a testimony, though, in what John saw. Let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. You see... A mere mortal man who went through what Jesus went through could not carry the cross. If you took a king, I believe Matthew portrays Jesus as a king. If you took a king, a human king, and you beat him the way they beat Jesus, and you put a cross, he would not be carrying it out of that trial. If you look at Jesus as a servant the way Mark portrays Jesus as a servant, and you beat a servant the way they treated Jesus, he would not be able to carry a cross out of that trial. Luke, if Luke sees Jesus as a man, if a mere man who went through what Jesus went through got beat like him, a mere mortal man would not be carrying the cross out of there. He couldn't, he wouldn't even recognize it as a human. But yet, what did John see? John saw Jesus as God, somebody that could bear it and that could carry it out. 
That's all John saw. John saw Jesus carrying his own cross, um, who should not have been able to, under the beatings and the torture that he went through, he should not have been able to carry that. But that's what John saw. Matthew chapter 19, or Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. This, I believe, was a prophecy. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And I believe that's what John saw. He bore his own cross. No, maybe he didn't carry it the whole way. But the one passage says he bore it, Simon bore the cross after Jesus which has an implication that maybe Jesus did carry it all the way. Maybe he just had a helper that grabbed a hold of it with him. I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe he grabbed the cross and followed Jesus as Jesus walked up. But I do know this. There was some point in there throughout the very beginning that John saw something different that the others didn't see. But remember, John was on the inside. The others weren't. And John saw Jesus bearing his own cross carrying it out. Quite thought-provoking, isn't it? When you think about what really takes, took place at the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, I did have a couple other questions. One I will bring up next week. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into one briefly, and if we need to, we'll finish it next week. Someone asked last week, if the Bible condemns drinking, if the Bible condemns drinking, then why did Jesus make wine at the wedding? And turn, right. Why did he turn water into wine at the wedding if he condemns drinking? Very good question. Why would Jesus have turned water into wine if wine is supposedly bad? Well, that's where we have to come to the understanding of Bible words. Bible words. Because remember, the same word used in the Bible does not mean the same thing every time. As a matter of fact, and I'm not going to go into it, but you can, if you want to look it up, you can get fermented wine or unfermented wine. Okay, wine is not always alcoholic. In order, to, in order to make wine alcoholic, you have to add a major ingredient, yeast. In order to make it alcoholic, you have to add yeast. It has to be done. Other than that, it just sours it rots and it just tastes nasty like like sweet tea that just goes bad overnight you ever had tea that went bad you know what it didn't last long enough around the house to go bad did it <laughs> i tell you what if you ever drink tea that goes bad it's awful now i'll show you a few a couple of verses okay Couple of verses we're going to go into. We'll go, we'll go to where that passage was, John chapter 2. I'm not going to spend a long time on this. I'll probably go a little bit more into it next week as well. But John chapter 2. I do not understand why people want to claim that this whole time it was an alcoholic wine and that they gave an alcoholic wine to these people until they got so drunk they couldn't handle it and then they would imply that then they'd give them even worse alcoholic wine. It just doesn't make sense. But people want to claim that. 
I do not believe in this passage at all that anything that it's referring to was alcoholic. Okay, I don't believe that. And I can show you um, some of the things in the Old Testament, but I want to look at first, let's look at um, verse number 9. We know the story of Jesus turning water into wine. I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to jump backwards. But in John chapter 2, verse 9, they fill these water pots with water, right? And then they take them to the ruler of the feast, the governor of these, the guy that's in charge of the food, the pr food preparation for this wedding. Verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew this guy was supposed to have planned the entire meal and no food or drink was supposed to show up without him knowing who it was, where it was coming from. And I, I mean, he, he was literally the, over the whole meal preparation. And you don't just add food to a chef's menu and say, here, we're, we're sticking this in on your menu too. He's going to say, ah, uh, this is my career. This is what I know. You don't just, and all of a sudden this stuff shows up and he's like, where did this come from? which drew the water, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, verse 10, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but now, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Now, when it says well drunk, it's not talking about they got drunk. It's saying they've had so much that their taste buds are now off because you ever eaten, you ever eaten a Russell Stover chocolate? You ever eaten 30 or 40 of them at the same time? Do you know the last ones don't taste like the first ones did? I don't know if you knew that. But after you've had so many of them, they start losing their taste. But not, it's not that they didn't taste the same. It's your taste buds have gotten so just burned out by it temporarily. They don't want anymore. Your taste buds don't. Even though your brain says, I like chocolate, and your stomach says, keep feeding me, your tongue says, it's just not tasting the same. It says, you start out with a good wine, and, all, and when everyone's had their fill, and they've, they've had so much, you stick the old stuff out, the, or the, the stuff that's not as good, just not as fresh, not, doesn't have the, as good a flavor, you stick it out there. Listen to this, though. Let's go back to verse number five. Everything Jesus did was about keeping things pure, remember? Verse 5, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. He picked some special, some special pots that were made for purification purposes. Not stuff that not pots that are just any old pot. He didn't just go and grab anything. Everything Jesus did was about purity. And he says, I'm going to grab these pots. These are the ones that are they're used for the purification and things like that, for their, their keeping the cleanliness. We're going to use those ones. The representation itself in these pots was purity. These very pots represented purity, not an altered state. Of an with an alcoholic beverage in it. Everything he did, I believe he chose for a purpose. Now, a couple verses, and then we'll let you think about it. But the first time we see somebody getting drunk is Noah. Now, I do not know Genesis chapter 9. I do not know personally if Noah himself got intentionally drunk it's very possible that he did but I don't know that he even knew exactly what he was doing but I know one thing I know that when he woke up he still remembered what happened which I can't say for somebody else a few chapters later that got drunk and had no idea what happened but in Genesis chapter 9 Later on in the chapter, after he had gotten off the ark, chapter 20, or verse, Genesis 9, 21, or verse 20 says, And Noah began to be in husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, he got drunk off the wine from his own vineyard. 
I do not know that if it was intentional or whatever, but I do know this. Verse 24, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So there was something about this wine that didn't completely inebriate him. It didn't completely destroy his understanding of what was going on. He had an understanding still of what was going on. He knew what had happened. But Genesis chapter 19 I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this one. Genesis chapter 19. We have a man named Lot who gets drunk. And verse number 33, the very last phrase, I'm just going to, Read verse 33, the Bible says, And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. He had no clue. And then it happens again. So we know that there are stages in alcohol and getting drunk that up to this point, it looks like they've started to perfect the uh, making of wine. <laughs> to where it really can do a number on you, a whole lot different than it did on Noah. Noah was able to still wake up and understand what was going on. He didn't have a clue, Lot didn't. I wanna show you one more passage, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, I'm gonna, I'll bring this up next week and we'll go bring a few more verses along with the other questions. So we know that Jesus made wine, right? And we know that people in the Old Testament got drunk on wine, right? We know that. It's scriptural. Jesus turned water into wine. People in the Old Testament got drunk on wine. We know that. Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. There has to be a difference in the wine, the, the very one. There has to be a difference or Jesus was not the Savior. If there is not a difference in the two types of wine, then Jesus is not God. Then Jesus is actually a pawn of Satan himself. The Bible says here in, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, it says what? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So if Jesus was giving away wine that would cause you to be deceived, that would inebriate you, then Jesus himself was a palm of, of Satan himself. If he's giving away wine... If Jesus was giving away alcoholic wine that would inebriate the mind, then Jesus was sinning. Because according to here, that kind of wine is whosoever is what? Deceived. Who's the deceiver? Satan. He's a liar from the beginning. So if Satan is the deceiver and this kind of wine is deceiving, then if Jesus gave away that kind of wine at the wedding, then Jesus would be part of deceitfulness which would make him a sinner and not God. So there has to be a difference in the two types of wine. There has to be. Or Jesus himself is not who he said he was. And we need to look somewhere else. Now there's a lot of other verses. I've got a bunch written down. That is just, I'm going to leave you with that just for tonight. To think about. That when we drink things and we take things into our body that actually inebriate, destroy the mind intentionally, destroy the ability to act, when we do something that literally deceives our own life and we think, well, it's just helping me feel better. Is it? Most people drink for two reasons. Personal pleasure. It makes me feel good. Now, I might not taste good. Makes it. And another major reason is help me forget something. Help me forget. 
One, it helps me feel good. Makes me, I see things that aren't really there. I, I, I don't like to mock. But it is funny to watch two drunk people try to help each other do something. You just sit there and you wonder, do they have a clue? I mean, they, they just do some crazy things and they think they're helping each other and they're not. They think they're helping each other. I've been around the military. I've been around the military. I've seen what happens when you get a couple drunk sailors. Or they try arm in arm trying to walk themselves somewhere. You've seen it. It's very helpful, isn't it? I mean, people, people's lives are benefited by that, aren't they? No. It's deceitful. You walk out of there thinking, everything's wonderful. I feel great. I don't have a care in the world. Why? You can't have a care in the world. Your brain cells have been fried. You can't have a care in the world. You can't be thinking properly. So, with just that thought in mind, if Jesus gave alcoholic wine at the wedding then Jesus himself was part of deception. Do you want to put him in that category? Your savior? If he was, then he's no longer the Bible, who the Bible calls God. He's somebody else. He's an imposter. So, hope those answer some of your questions. We're going to get more. I've got a lot more Bible verses. We'll, we'll go a little more into that one. And I've got another one. We had some verses on Zion and and uh, I've been, I've had some good, enjoyable studies. And uh, I had that last one I looked into today. And uh, I've had a, a great time. You ought, you ought to join me and try studying and reading. It's fun. I get excited. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you for the opportunity we have once again to fellowship with each other. Thank you for the wonderful meal that we had downstairs and the time to fellowship. Thank you for the word of God that gives answers to our questions and, and life's problems. Thank you for Jesus Christ being God. Thank you for the creation that you made. Lord, I've never seen a dragon. I never have. I, I think it would be pretty neat, but from a very, very long distance. Lord, I thank you for all the wonderful things that you have made that we can get close to and that we can observe and watch just how beautiful how marvelous are your works lord i just want to say thank you for the word of god and, and i pray that you would help us to read it and study it lord last but not least thank you for being the example to us and showing john that you even carried your own cross when more than likely physically you should not have been able to thank you for that testimony May we realize that you would never ask us to do or go through anything that you've not already done or gone through. You understand life. You were tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Lord, you went through it. May we walk through it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.